Every crime has got its components, uh, the steps, if you will, that the crime has to kind of go through in order for us to find it. Well, in order for it to happen, bodies don't just fall over dead. There are, there are a whole bunch of components that have got to come together and kind of make sense. Murder weapon ain't going to stab itself in the back of the victim and it ain't going to just appear out of thin air. It's got to be a, a location and people involved and there's stuff. It's components. It's all got to come together and that's our job. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of How to Be a Great GM. My name is Guy and today we're going to be looking at some very interesting things. The fundamental components of role playing. The sexy six as I like to call them. Because there are six things that make up a role playing game in my humble opinion. And we're going to go through those. We're going to see how they influence and change and adapt and adjust and how we can use them to make our games that much better. If you understand how these six work with one another, you're in a much stronger position to be able to do stuff on the fly, to improvise, to create better adventures and better stories. So what are they? Let's just get straight into it. Bang! There they are. There are the six, the sexy six. Mechanics, obviously. There has to be some kind of rule system in place. If you're sitting around without any kind of rule structure and anything can happen, yes, it is certainly a creative journey, but that's more like a collaborative story where there really are no rules and you can go in any direction. So we need mechanics. We need a narrative. We need a direction as much as that might sound strange, but we need to go in a specific direction. We need a narrative. We need a setting. We can't play in multiple different settings. Remember, this is a group play game. There are players and there is a game master. There are players, there is a storyteller. There are players, it, there are multiple people involved here. So we need to have a setting that we all agree upon in a certain sense of the word. We need players. We need a game masetta. A game masetta, a masetta is Italian for master. It's maestro is actually. But so a masetta is, is, is what happens when you don't have a typesetter. A masetta. So your game masetta, this is not how to be a great speller. So just be quiet. The game master and then tools. The tools being dice, maps, figurines, tokens, three-dimensional printed terrain, all kinds of things. Those are the tools. It also includes D&D Beyond or Fantasy Grounds or Roll20 or online stuff or tablet stuff or World Anvil, all of those kinds of things that lumped into tools. And we're going to see how they all, they all relate together. So uh, let's just see what happens first. Ah, yes. Well, the whole thing is, the idea is, is that some things bring things into existence by simply being there and other things are brought into existence because they needed to be there in order for the thing that brought them into existence to actually exist. It's a bit of a, a chicken and an egg kind of situation but provided that you realise that the chicken is not in charge of the egg but that the egg is actually in charge of the chicken by virtue of the fact that if the egg wasn't there the chicken wouldn't possibly be able to be born because what it would come out of there would need to be an egg for that to happen but the egg is totally dependent upon the chicken to actually have a purpose and in other words be created in the first place. Do, do you see the connections? Absolutely. Of course you What? <laughs> yes. So so let's get let's get there. So what is the first step? Well, there they are. There they are on this template. Hello. I'm going to stick out over here. Okay. So there they are uh, as, an, as an outline, if you like, as an outline. I'm, I'm going to hide because this is an important sheet. So there they are as an outline. Mechanics, tool setting, narrative players, game master. Why is the game master in the middle, you might ask? Well, because if you remove the game master from the entire equation, yes, a game could be run by players, but you still need something, some controlling force to instigate stuff. So there are many board games where there is no game master and the board game itself is what drives the story. That's absolutely fine. And yes, it's certainly role-playing as, as an interpretation of what role-playing is. 
but it's not really role playing in the sense of what we're talking about. So these are the six fundamentals. So let's see how they work together. Now, this is the technique. Control, guidance and influence. Control, guidance and influence. Those are the results or the effects or the relationships, if you like, between those things. Now, they relate to each other in multiple different ways. And unfortunately, I can't display this as a three dimensional image because there are some pathways that should be displayed, but which I physically can't do. At least I couldn't figure it out in the way that I had laid this thing out. So those are the three control, guidance and influence. Now, before you judge, before you judge, we will we will get there. All three of these require something very important. Yeah, we've spoken about the social contract in the past, and if there's more interest in that, we can revisit the topic. But the idea that there is a dictatorship, a friendly dictatorship, if you so choose, it's important that there is this recognition that there is someone who's in charge and whose final word is final. Now, if you have the inclination to argue with those who are running the game, then you run the game. Why not? If you think you know better, or if you do actually know better, then there's nothing wrong with that. Run the game yourself. If the person who is running the game does not want your help or your assistance in order to run the game better or more accurately, you must respect that because that is the ultimate contract that we are making. The sharing of power is an illusion in this case. There are power struggles going on all over the place. Well, struggle is not the right word, but there is there is a space where everyone has to do their part. Make sure you are doing your part and not trying to do the part of somebody else. Precisely. The social contract that these are the three things that control those six fundamentals, it's important that we recognize them because if a player in your group doesn't recognize these three things as being the relationship that they are within the game, conflict will arise. It will arise and you will end up on my live shows saying, I have a player who's very disruptive. What do I do? They're disruptive because usually they don't see this or they don't understand it anyway. So let's get in there. Right. Control. Control in this sense means authoritative rule. You need someone to be able to say, I am the law and I am in charge. So whoever is controlling an element, they are in charge of that. And it is their responsibility because they're in charge of it to make sure that it does what it does. It is a fundamental requirement, by the way, that these individuals are in charge, that they are in control, that they are the final voice in the game so that there is that responsibility because it gives us structure. The structure to say this is a conflict. This is something that we don't know. This is a rules call. This is a story call. This is a character call. This is a, a I'm confused call. Someone or something, whatever one has decided to be in control, needs to be there to give us the structure to figure out how to resolve it. Otherwise, you get no result whatsoever. If the game master is not in control of certain aspects of the game, who's going to make that final call? Is it going to be the story? No. Story is, doesn't exist. It's a construct. Is it the narrative? No. Is it the setting? No. So we've got to look and see who's in control and accept it. Accept it. So let's see this in action. Right. So there's us. This is our setting. I didn't give myself much space here. For such a big man, you'd think I'd have given myself a bit more room. There's the setting. Let's look at those control arrows. Wow! <coughs> Mind blown. Oh, I've been hit by an arrow. I was a game master and then I took an arrow to the knee. I had to do it. Okay, so game master. Look at the arrows of control. The game master, and starting from the center top, the game master is in control of the tools. The game master is in control of the tools. I choose to use maps, says the game master. 
I choose not to use maps, says the Game Master. The players can ask, hey, could we use battle maps? The Game Master will say, yes, I have a subscription to Dungeon Fog, for which I use the code GREATGM to get a discount for that subscription. Or, I had to do it, I, I, I had to do it, anyway. Or, they go, no, these will be hand-drawn maps, or theatre of the mind. We will not be using any of those particular tools. The Game Master might say you can use any electronic device you like at the table. The Game Master might say no. The Game Master, in theory, should be able to say those dice are illegible and you can't use them at my table. So the Game Master is in charge, is in control of the tools. This is because the Game Master will be able to use those tools to enhance their job. A battle map is only as good as its creator and will either detract from the game or add to it. The players might might have influence over those tools, we'll get to that later on, but they're not in control of them. The Game Master is in control of the setting. The Game Master is responsible for creating that setting, as, as a matter of fact. They might ask, if they're a good Game Master, for input from the players. Hey, I'm creating this race, give me some input. If they do that, the players will feel engaged with the setting and not just wandering through it as tourists. But ultimately, when something happens in the kingdom or in the universe, it is the Game Master who is in control of that. Who determines what the NPCs do? The Game Master. And that means the Game Master is also in control of the narrative. The Game Master controls the narrative. I have decided that this NPC will talk to you and tell you everything that you need to know. I have decided this NPC will not. The Game Master is in complete control over the narrative, and at no point should the players be in control of the narrative. You're going to see what they are doing to the narrative later on, but they're not in control of it. They can't say, I turn to the blacksmith and ask him to give me my armour for free. He does so. They can say, I turn to the blacksmith and ask him to give me my armour for free, at which point the Game Master is then in control and says no, or yes, depending on how he wants the narrative to play out. Notice the narrative is also in charge of the setting. What this means is, is if you say the king has died, all hear ye, the setting now must change as a result. It is under the control of the narrative. So the narrative has said the king is dead, the narrative was controlled by the Game Master, and so the setting must change. The setting shouldn't change the narrative, because that means that something that you wrote 20 years ago is having a major effect on your story, and that you are no longer in control of the story as the Game Master, but now the setting is. In which case you are no longer a Game Master, but a facilitator. So the narrative is in charge of the setting. An interesting one is the players. The players are in charge of the Game Master. Think about it for a moment. A game master can be in charge of the tools, the setting, and the narrative, but if they don't have any players, they don't have a game. The players are also the ones who can say, yeah, I can't write the setting for you, and I can't determine the narrative, but I can tell you that I will never ever 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 and I mean ever play a My Little Ponies campaign. So you can be in charge of all of that. I will never, ever, 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 ever... You get the point. So the players are in charge of the Game Master, and that, remember, adds a huge amount of pressure and responsibility onto the players. The person that is in charge is responsible. Responsible for structure for guiding and controlling the outcomes. So the players have to make sure that the Game Master that they are in control of has the necessary tools, the necessary empowerment to do their job. So players who refuse to give backstories, players who don't want to engage with NPCs, players who don't want to give the Game Master the power they need in order to run everything else, are actually players who have failed the entire system. So the players are in charge of the Game Master. The mechanics are in charge of everybody. Now I thought I would never say this on this channel, 
but they really are. And we need those mechanics to be in charge of everything because it gives us structure. So the mechanics are in charge of the players. The players can only do what the mechanics will allow them to do. The mechanics are in charge of the game master. The game master should only be allowed to do what the game master is allowed to do. Now here's the caveat. Most rule books say that the game master's word is final in terms of mechanics interpretation. And I, for one, will certainly always advocate that as a game master, the rules should be there to help you tell your story. And they certainly are. But it is the game master who has to figure out how to use the mechanics in order to tell that story. That's the responsibility of the game master. The mechanics responsibility is to provide the structure within which to do that. So the game master shouldn't say, well, today's saving throws are not going to work like that. They're going to work like this. Today, the game master could say, well, yes, there is a saving throw involved, but you can also use this rule to affect the outcome. And perhaps it isn't written that both of those rules can be used together. Perhaps that's been left vague in the mechanics. But it is the game master who is allowed to then use their power as granted by the mechanics in most of, most of the games to then do that. The mechanics are in charge of the tools. If you are playing a game that requires figurines or specific distances, 10 foot movement or 50 foot movement or a blast radius of 30 feet, the mechanics might prescribe that you use certain tools to do this. Today, there is an invasion into our role playing space of digital technology, making our games better of tools to enhance our games. The mechanics must be in charge of those tools and not the other way around. We're going to play Dungeons and Dragons, but we're going to change up some of the rules because we need them to fit our tools. It shouldn't work that way and it doesn't work that way. So that's how control works. That is who is in charge of what, who is responsible for making sure that the other system that they are responsible for works and has all of the resources and the ability to operate as possible. So that's control. So when we then move forward, well, we have to ask someone about this first. Restriction or control should be there to encourage you to be more creative. If you say you must wear this hood at all times for it creates an air of mystery and enigma, well then one must learn how to work within the confines of that and to accept that forever you will have this little pointed thing in the middle of your face which kind of causes you to look a bit strange. But nonetheless the control and creativity is what it's all about. We must learn to work within the space at which we work for that is truly how we are creative, no? Guidance. Guidance. What's the difference between control and guide? Quite simply, guidance is creative interpretation. It is providing options, providing inspiration, perhaps. Control doesn't provide inspiration. Control dictates how things must happen. Guidance allows you to go, oh, well, that's what's supposed to happen. But how could we make it more interesting? How could we twist it up? How could we do it something differently? How could we really work with what we have to make it better. Guidance is more of a, like I say, creative angle than a controlling angle. So let's bring up our guidance. Guidance is in green here. So guidance is, again, working around the clock. The tools guide the game master. Now you might say, well, hang on a moment, the game master is in charge of the tools. Yes, yes, the game master is. So when you decide to make a battle map or to make three-dimensional terrain, if you are not guided by that, then you are passing up a huge opportunity. As you are drawing the battle map, you find that, oh, a paint splot has turned into a giant flowing volcano. Where did that volcano come from? The Game Master is in charge of the setting and so can add a volcano quite easily. The tool has helped guide the Game Master. Maybe the tool allows for three-dimensional building. Maybe the tool allows for fog of war. However and whatever the tools do, they should guide the Game Master to be able to make a better story. The setting should guide both the tools 
and the Game Master. But the Game Master is in charge of the setting. Yes, yes, the Game Master is in charge of the setting, but settings bring expectations. The Game Master decides the setting will be pirates. The setting now guides the Game Master, saying, well, if you want pirates, that's fine, but you are going to need to have some things to make it a pirate game, like ships, nautical campaign books, he said. All these kinds of things need to then feed back to the Game Master. And a lot of people don't look to their own creation for, 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 for guidance, for, for direction and, and for little points that need to happen. The setting then also guides the tools. OK, well, we want to do a desert based adventure, um, so I'm actually going to make a box that's full of sand. It's going to be disastrous, but it's going to be awesome. And the players are going to sit in that box so they can feel the sand under their feet as we play the game. I mean, that would be insanely immersive and what a nightmare to clean up afterwards. But the setting certainly should guide the tools. The setting also guides the narrative. Hang on a moment. Isn't the narrative in charge of the setting? Yes, it is. It's in control of the setting. But once again, as the setting guided the game master in terms of, well, hey, you need to have some ships and you need to fulfill these expectations. And if it's a desert, it should be hot. Or maybe you're going to go in the opposite direction where it's cold or just dry. There are options there. The settings should also inform the narrative. The king of the castle, if it is in a medieval time period, is not going to say something like, I think we should construct a flying machine. It really, 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 really shouldn't. So the setting is going to guide the narrative in terms of what the character can and can't say. I've done a whole video series where we talk about coming up with dialogue on the fly. And part of that is talking about the NPC's job. If their job is air traffic controller and you're playing in a Roman based game, that doesn't fit well. The game master is in charge of the setting and in charge of the narrative. But the setting is going to say, well, the Romans didn't have a lot of air traffic control, unless you're talking about griffins and fantastical creatures. Now the Game Master changes the setting, because the Game Master is in control of the setting, to include griffins and airborne creatures. And suddenly the setting is now saying to the narrative, oh, you wanted to have, you wanted to have um, flying air traffic controllers? Well, now you can. Here's how it works. And do you see it's in a circle? The narrative guides the Game Master. But hang on a moment, the Game Master is in charge of the narrative. Yes. But if you're using a three-act structure for your narrative, that three-act structure is the narrative, and that should guide you as the Game Master. I'm in my opening, so I'm introducing the villains and the monsters and, and, and the setting and the time pace and that kind of thing. The narrative is guiding you on that. Listen to that guidance, and it will be a lot stronger. The narrative is also guiding the players. I talk to the king contemptuously. You get arrested and thrown into prison. The narrative is guiding the player, saying, Hey, I'm driven by the setting, and the setting dictates that if you are disrespectful to the king, you go to prison. Or you get your head cut off, depending on which kingdom you happen to be in. Because the setting guides the narrative, the narrative guides the outcome for the players, and so there you go. The narrative is not in charge of the players, by the way. Neither is the GM. The players are in charge of their own destiny. They can choose what they want to do. The narrative, however, does need to have repercussions based on the setting for the players. The players, are, it's just a chaos ball, isn't it? The players guide the game master. How do the players guide the game master? My character's backstory is that I was raised in a nunnery and have 400 sisters. I left the nunnery because my guitar broke and I wanted to have it repaired. And when I went back, the entire nunnery had vanished into thin air. So now I'm looking for that nunnery. The player has just guided the Game Master so that the Game Master can go and control the setting to now add in a whole bunch of convents all over the place of disappearing nuns. That then creates a narrative of disappearing nuns being taken by some diabolical entity who needs a nunnery or three because he heard nunnery instead of shrubbery. The Game Master guides the players. The Game Master is in control of all sorts of things, but should never be in control of the characters, of the players themselves. That means that the Game Master needs to guide the players. To guide the players, here's a mentor NPC. 
here's a sign on a board that says do not go any further. This is a direct kind of guidance that I'm talking about and is quite, quite critical that it is within the narrative and the setting, that it's not out of game. That is not something that we want when we're talking about guidance. The mechanics should guide the players. How do I interpret my strength of this score? How do I interpret that value? How do I interpret this value? What does that look like? The mechanics, although you are bound by them because the mechanics control the players, they also guide the players to creating interesting characters based on the mechanical restrictions that they are given. Necessity is the mother of all invention. The mechanics should also guide the game master. Now we know the mechanics control the game master, but the mechanics should also guide the game master. Well, here's these, the, the, here are the rules. But you can also do this, and there are also rules that do that. So if the game master knows the rules really well, the rules can become a guide in terms of how to get out of a tight spot or to make a spot more interesting. Then the tools, of course, should guide the game master, and we've spoken about that. So that's guidance. That's guidance. So I'm going to bring back those control arrows just so that you can see that flow. There's the control, there's the guidance. Most of the time, most of the time, the control and the guidance are flowing in opposite directions, except for the mechanics and for the players. So bear that in mind. So that is, that is guidance. Now, so it seems I'm back uh, to talk about how influence should not be seen as negative. As you're going to see, it's coming up. It's, it's, it, yeah. That's not what the intention is. The intention is, is that everyone has their role to play. Everyone has a duty that they must fulfill. And if that means that you need to influence those who are outside of the game, that is also part of the social contract, is that we are trying to tell something together. We have that paragraph that we started off the first circle agreeing to. This is the mandate. This is what we are trying to do. In which case, then, we must make sure that we bring our fellows back onto track. That can sometimes also mean having an open and frank conversation saying, listen, what you did there, I don't think fits within the mantra and within the agreement of what we are trying to achieve here. Can you help me to understand why you feel it fits within that space? Or perhaps you're not aware that you violated that space in the first place. Let's learn together. That's always a good way of handling these kinds of questions. Let's learn together. I want to understand so that we can have a better game because we're aligned rather than opposed. Yeah. Influence. Influence is interacting with altering and manipulation of the players and of the game master outside of the game. Influence is metagame game. Game, mean. Influence is where we as human beings interpret our fellow human beings and try to influence the outcomes. And I don't mean manipulate in terms of the evil connotations. Oh, I am manipulating you to do my bidding. More along the lines of, I'm manipulating you to have this particular outcome because I think it's going to be more entertaining than the one that you're doing. It is the positive manipulation, the positive alteration of plans to suit our fellow human beings. That's what influence is all about. And we must use it cautiously and wisely. And I think you're going to be very, very interested to see who influences what. So this is control. This is guidance. Now we get influence. Who influences what? Let's get rid of these other arrows. The game master has no influence over the tools and the tools have no influence over the game master. Unless the game master is a coding genius and can rewrite the code, but there is very little metagaming that needs to happen. Having said that, by choosing to make maps or to make the room atmospheric by utilizing those tools, you can influence the players to a small degree 
But I would argue that that's not influencing the tools, that's using the tools, that's being guided by the tools that you have access to, to influence the players. So it's not really influencing the actual tools themselves. You are not a Jedi, Qui-Gon Jinn. The setting, the setting subtly influences the Game Master. Yes, it does. It guides the Game Master, as we saw previously. If you want a desert campaign, you need to have camels and oases and, um, you know, people in, in flowing robes and things because that's practical to wear in the desert. But it can also influence the Game Master positively and negatively, and we have to be aware of that. If you're going to be playing in a Star Wars campaign, there is a lot of meta that comes with that. There's a huge amount of meta that comes with that. If you're going to be playing in a Star Trek game, there's even more that comes with that. How is that going to influence or manipulate you? Well, you're going to either try to strive to recreate those kind of situations where you're going to restrict yourself so you've been meta-manipulated into making a marvelously mess of the entire thing. Or it could influence you in a positive way where you keep more on track. You find ways to adapt the player's interactions to make it feel as if it fits within that space. So the influence sits not just in terms of what you should have, but it also starts to control what you have, and that's a very bad thing. The setting obviously influences the narrative. It really does. It guides the narrative in terms of, well, this is probably what was going to happen, this is probably what was going to happen. But again, there's that meta. We expect mad emperors to cut off the heads of, 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 of individuals. And when it doesn't happen, we get, we get horridly dislocated. We call it the suspension of disbelief. When the setting has been posited and suddenly the narrative breaks it, things go very, very wrong. Players go, oh, who's ever heard of a river flowing up uphill? It just doesn't happen. It really doesn't. Well, it actually does, but technically it's, it's a tidal thing and it's... anyway. The idea is, is that the setting, if it is not influencing the narrative outside of the basic story it becomes a problem the players influence the narrative all the time now how do they do this talking to an npc and asking for help is not influencing the narrative it's discovering the narrative it's engaging with the narrative but a player who goes i'm bored with this story let's just go north why well, because it's not where the narrative is, and I want to go north. They've now influenced the game on two levels. They've guided the narrative in terms of, okay, we're now going to explore the north, but they have influenced the narrative, hopefully the GM has picked up on this, that they want to do something differently. They want to change course. What is happening is boring. This is a big clue, this influence that the players have over the narrative. As game masters, we must be very, very aware of this. When players start to do irrational or weird things, when they try and influence the narrative or, dare say, control the narrative, we must be aware why are they doing it and how can we who are in control of the narrative adjust so that it goes back to the players interacting with the narrative rather than trying to change it or control it or manipulate it. The Game Master certainly manipulates the players. It's about listening to the player conversations after the game, before the game, and even during the game, and going, well, they really like that combat, I'm going to give them more. They really like this, I'm going to give them more of that. So the players are in control of the Game Master, remember. It is the Game Master who influences the players in terms of, well, let's just nudge it in this direction. Let's nudge it in that direction. I'm going to use a mentor who's going to berate the character, but through that I'm berating the player as well. I'm trying to change or educate or manipulate the player to do something that I think is more entertaining because I'm responsible for the narrative and the setting. The Game Master obviously influences the mechanics because the Game Master can choose which ones to apply and which ones not to apply as the circumstance arises. So they should be guided by the mechanics and they are controlled and bound by those mechanics. But the Game Master can ask for a call at any point for a check or a die roll or could even just roll a die and then decide later on that that's the value that they needed or didn't need so they can exclude it. You've got to be very careful about that because, once again, it can break the players if they see that you're applying some rules occasionally and others not. So try and be consistent in that. Try and always use your manipulative influence 
to drive the narrative forward to do what needs to be done. So when we bring up all of these arrows in all of their different directions, we can see that there is definitely a flow. There are definitely individuals who are responsible for a great many spaces. The game master is wholly responsible for the setting and the narrative. But the players are in an influential situation and in a guiding kind of situation for the game master, which ultimately means that the players are in charge of the game right from the get go. And that the game master is there doing their job of creating this space, of being the authority. There's a reason why there is only one uh, entity, if you like, that is higher than the game master. And that's the players. And the rules obviously have a significant play as well. They control three aspects of the game. The game master controls three aspects of the game. The players control one aspect of the game. That little cycle between setting, narrative, and game master, I think, should also be particularly, particularly looked at, just from a perspective of, okay, who's in charge of what. So this is, this is my interpretation of how the world works in terms of role playing, and those templates, by the way, will be available on our website. I'm going to share it as well on social media where I actually have a key included so you can see what's going on. So you can look at that and you might disagree. And that's what the comments are for about down below. If you disagree, we can interpret, we can discuss, we can explore, and perhaps we can enhance that diagram or change it if there is a salient point that has been raised that makes sense. Now for some homework. This is the first circle after all, and it is about seeing whether or not you have understood this concept well enough that you are able to fly with it. Now, it looks like a lot of work, but it actually isn't. Because I've done the homework for you. You just need to be able to prove it, if you are so inclined, or find your own example. So, select a film, book, TV, show, play, whatever the hell it is that you like to, to, to look at. Then identify a mechanic, which is a unique rule or, uh, of the narrative, of the, of the, of the, of the play, or, or whatever. That could be the force. It could be magic. It could be mind melding. It, it, but choose a mechanic. And a particularly a mechanic that was used to control a character and when the character learned to use the mechanic to their advantage. So uh, the force. The force was used to manipulate and control and then it was manipulated and controlled by the character. The example I give or I could think of was the Matrix. We see the mechanics in play. The main protagonist then oh, learns the mechanic and then uses the mechanic against the system. So it's important to see that cycle of how mechanics and players and story all combine together. The story, of course, in these is the game master. Then find an example where the setting guided the narrative. So the setting was responsible for what was taking place. The 1980s horror films, or actually it could just be horror films. Usually the setting is integral to the horror film. So think about another example where the setting guides the narrative. Then look for an example where the character's action influenced the narrative. So the character does something completely unexpected and so changes up the entire, entire, entire story. By the way, that is almost every story ever told. Someone does something truly bizarre and causes an, a massive chain reaction. The reason why it's important for you to find one of these stories, choose a story that you like. It could be all three could come from the same story, by the way, from the same source. Look at the mechanic, look at the setting and the character and the actions that they take and then change it and see if that story still runs true. So in The Matrix, what happens if the character didn't learn the code or did learn the code and instead joined with the machine? Look at those stories, look at how they are influenced so that you can see that in this gigantic relationship of who's in charge of whom and what happens where and, and who's in control and who guides and who influences and all those kind of wonderful things. If you can understand that, you'll be in a situation where when you sit down for session zero, you tell your players, this is how I see this game working. Do you all agree? It resolves a whole lot of issues. It really does. 
and it will make your game flow faster, flow better. It will help guide you to having a better game and allow you to influence the game in meaningful and positive ways, which is really what this whole thing is all about, is having a positive, fun, collaborative experience. Until next time, I wish you and yours the very happiest of... <laughs> Let's try that one again. I wish you and yours the very happiest of playing. Look, 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 I've been watching you. Yeah, you're a smart one. That's dangerous sometimes. Now, once you understand all of the different components and how they're supposed to work together and who controls who, like I control you, like it controls me, once we understand that, once you get that fundamental, suddenly you're freed up. Why are you freed up? You're freed up because you are able then to spend your time focusing on the parts that you are responsible for and not trying to figure out what's gone wrong because some part is missing. So in other words, you become more creative once you know what you've got to work with. It's all about coming up with a proper plan. I've said it before and I'll say it again. You need a plan. Always. Why is your hand up? Why? 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 <sighs>